You're, 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 you're listening to the podcast for all of the news, notes, and breakdowns for your Ohio State Buckeyes. This is Sons of the Shoe with Nick Wilson and Spencer German. Sons of the Shoe rides again. Nick Wilson, Spencer German back at it. As always, guys, we are a relatively new podcast, so we plead for you to follow the show on Apple, Spotify, 923thefan.com, the free Odyssey app, wherever you get your podcast. Have I mentioned Apple? Follow Sons of the Shoe today. Of course, we're also available. Uh, you might be watching us on the 923 The Fan YouTube channel. Please make sure to like the channel and uh, and subscribe and then like our videos as well. You'll see us commenting there. But we just got to rip the Band-Aid off right here. We've already started this show. <laughs> and Spencer and I just did like seven of the best minutes of of this podcast we've ever done. It was good. Only for midpoint. We were ha- we started the topic even. We got into the topic. We had some grab ass and going on to start. <laughs> and Spencer, right off the rip, seven minutes in goes, oh. And immediately I was like, I don't see a time stamp up here. Are we recording? <laughs> so unfortunately, if you don't like the first seven minutes of this, of this show, <laughs> it's because the better seven minutes – we're basically not recorded. They're just they've just poof gone into the ether. Yeah, they're gone for they're gone forever. Unfortunately, yeah. I, I will say this: the one saving grace is that I'm glad I caught it seven minutes in, rather than like twenty minutes in, and then we would have been like, "Well, shit, Nick's got to get going to work." Like now we don't have enough time to record the whole thing, and then I would have been doing another episode without you. So I'm just glad that we get to start with still time to spare, and we caught our error a little bit earlier on. And most importantly, I'm glad to have you back because I think our audience was getting a little bit worried that you weren't here. You uh, you would have had to do a podcast for 45 minutes on the podcast that we did <laughs> that was not recorded. <laughs> yeah, well, I think Nick said this, and and I would like to point out that I'm glad you brought up the the fact that you know the audience missing us um, because one of the things we talked about in the first go round was quite frankly, um, there's 80 percent of the audience knows when you're going on vacation. Because you talk about it, like I'm always jubilant on going a vacation, dude. I, w- I went on a I, my vacation this last time was was moving. I said a vacation. I still <laughs> talked about it because it was time off, and the company paid me to do it. So eighty percent knows about it, and then there's the other twenty percent of the audience who, for whatever reason, just didn't wasn't tuning in at the right time. And so then you see them on social media, and there's one or two ways to go. There is. Did something happen to Nick? Is he okay? Is Nick okay? Is he in the hospital? Did He's he okay. Uh, well, no, that's the other half. The other half is people hoping that you got fired. And that's and listen, I don't take it personally because not everybody can't be everybody's cup of tea, right? Um, Ken always tells the story about one time he logged on to Twitter, searched Vin Scully's name, and it was a bunch of people ragging on Vin Scully. If people rag, rag on, on Vin Scully, Vin Scully? It, well, because people oh, are a national treasure. But if people rag on Vin Scully, there's not, not one of us treasure. immune, right? Not none of us are immune from it. But it is very weird when you spent the week leading up to vacation saying, "Hey, next week." I'm not going to be here going full Magic Johnson. And then people were like, oh, Nick had fired? Hey, is Nick no longer here? Oh, oh I hope he got fired. Oh, I hate that fat, uh, fat guy. Ooh, that was close. That was I hate real. that fat ass. It's funny because in the first go around, we talked about getting fired. And what you almost said there would have been something yeah. that could have got you fired. Whew. So th- then people would have already been, oh, I think it's time to restart that, the podcast again. <laughs> it would have been less people saying, did Nick get fired? I'm like, oh, I know why Nick got fired. Yeah. After, 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 when you almost See, slipped up there. Um, that's actually, now that you've said that, when there's no question that you've been fired, way worse, way worse. Where, where Nick, is Nick on vacation? Nick, Nick fired, no much. But when everybody definitively knows, that's because <laughs> you went viral. And as I've said multiple times, one of these days I might get got, but I I want to get got without going viral. Yeah, that's that's definitely. I mean, you don't want to end up like. Uh... Tom Brenneman, right from uh, from the the Reds and, and that whole situation and the Nick Castellanos thing and that that's never the way you want to go. Like I, I understand sometimes the idea you like we romanticize the idea of like going out with a blaze of glory if you like quit your job or something like that. 
Nah, you, you don't want to go to blaze of glory when you say something that you can't say. And then that leads to you just getting fired. And then you got to try to ride it out. And no, not the way to go. So anyway, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're back. And I'm glad that you're not fired because we got a uh, NFL or we're not NFL, not NFL. This is a college football podcast, but we got college football coming up around the corner. And I'm very excited to uh, get ready for the season and then talk throughout the season about Ohio State with you. I'm ready for – it's so funny. I'm not ready for summer to be over. I am ready for college football more than I am uh, yeah. for pro. And I, I think I think it's because of college football 2025. For sure. Yeah, I I, I think that definitely plays a role in it for everybody. Like I, it's, I've seen a lot of the jokes going around where, you know, people are saying usually wives lose their husbands, you know, like first week of September – uh, or I guess like the last week of August, but they're like, this year you're losing your husbands like a month and a half earlier because the video game's coming out next week, which I know we're going to talk about a little bit later in the show. Um, but I do think that's maybe added to it. I, I will say I'm with you. Like the end of summer is always like bittersweet, but it's it's one of those hard things because you, you're like counting down the weeks. Like every Saturday I'm sitting here being like, oh, only seven Saturdays left to college football. And then you realize like that also means the end of summer and that like people like you and I are going to be extra busy that time of year. And it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I am excited about football, but I also have a lot more to do once you get to football season. So It's also the slippery slope of Ohio's fall. Like you think to yourself, what's well, just the end of summer? But the end of summer could turn into fall with a blink of an eye. Yeah. And then, you know, like the, the difference between the end of summer, fall and winter in Ohio, that can be three months it can be roughly three weeks and you don't really know what you're in for anymore because while we've had a lot of more tame winters recently we've also occasionally get that boomerang you know that 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 call back to what it used to be like before global warming made us more of a tropical yeah. uh, tropical paradise but no so we do have can i just uh, say real quick I, is Meg? the farmer's almanac always wrong like I, I, I we, like Jeff, uh, Jeff Phelps does those spots on our, on a 92, three, where mm -hmm. he talks about like, Oh, the farmer's almanac says it's going to be a bitter winter. And then like, la he said that last year. And then the winter was not, it was like a warm winter. We had like one big blizzard that required my neighbor to snow blow my driveway. And that was it. So I just, Jeff Phelps is the only person that still reads the farmer's almanac. <laughs> <laughs> actually the farmer's almanac is the jeff phelps of weather related no i'm kidding i'm kidding um just to make sure uh this is not a sponsorship that that jeff has with the farmer's almanac it's just an old man talking about the farmer's almanac am i well i think the farmer's he uses the farmer's almanac in a read for a different spot oh okay that's All what right. it is so it's not an official sponsor then no the farmer's almanac is simply the first weatherman and as we know Weathermen are on TV are either really attractive women or very chubby, <laughs> funny guys, because those are the people you're least likely to be angry with when they're wrong 80% of the time. That is fair. Um, which I have a whole other story, but we got to get into what Rick Neuheisel, longtime college football coach, now probably one of my favorite analysts out there. Um, cause I think he's really fair. He's also always very generous with his time. He comes on with us a lot on afternoon drive on 92 through the fan, but Rick was on ESPN college football, um, Sirius XM and said at, at, that when he was at a recent coaches event, that it's no secret that Phil Knight is supplying Oregon with unlimited NIL resources. And then uh, Rick went on to say Phil is 86. He desperately wants to see a championship. So they're willing to pay whatever it takes. And I think, well, I guess to start here, I'm in no way surprised that Phil Knight is, is supplying Oregon with unlimited NIL resources because that's simply an extension of what the man has done for really the last 30 to 40 years in Oregon athletics, which is supplying them unlimited resources. So it would make sense that those unlimited resources now flow to NIL as well. Yeah, and it's, it's not surprising. I also kind of – it's funny. I, I kind of hearken my – like my – grandfather who's in his eighties and getting up there in age. And he always like jokes around with us, uh, us, like our family members and talks about like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm getting up there. If I don't use the money while I'm alive, it does us no good anyway. And so he's like constantly trying to like bias things and whatever. And it's just his way of like, you know, giving back to us and helping us out in the pinch and, and things like that, which is nice. Does he I'm, need I'm... another grandson, by the way? <laughs> I like things being bought for you. You want to do adopt you as a grandson? Yeah. yeah, yeah like my, 
And I have a grandfather very generous with his money, his time, everything. I could always use another grandfather yeah, who's that, generous with yeah, those things. No, Just listen, that's very. Let, let Papa German know. If he wants to be a sponsor of uh, Sons of the Shoe, we're happy yeah. to take the money. Yeah. 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 Um, but, Only $5,000 yeah. a month. <laughs> but it's funny because, uh, like, I kind of I, I can envision somebody like Phil Knight being that age. Just being like the only thing I've ever wanted was a national championship for my Oregon Ducks. So I'm going to do everything I can to make it happen. And I think you're right. Like I'm assuming there was already a bankrolling situation going on pre NIL. And now he has a way to do like, you know, I guess or more, more organized the way he goes about it because you have NIL to sort of feed into the, the, the system and pay these players. So I, I definitely understand that that's the case. And I understand why it's a thing. Now what I do, and it's not that it's all that surprising, um, but when you hear it said out loud, the first thought I had was like, hmm, can Ohio State compete with that? And I and it's not to say like they can't, because clearly like this offseason, they've gone all in on the NIL stuff. But the difference is, like, I don't know if Ohio State has that one donor that's willing to do what Phil Knight's doing. Like, they have to kind of collect theirs from all different places. And we saw that this year. Like the fact that Ohio State had to crowdsource for the money that they got in NIL. They were sending emails to everybody trying to get people to donate. Like, I just wonder if, like, if, if you're, if, if, if you're worried about Oregon and it's a great conversation because one of the shows when you were when you were uh, gone uh, that I did was I asked like, is Oregon going to be that next rival to Ohio state after Michigan like, for years to come now? And I think that starts on the NIL circuit, right? It starts with them being able to recruit the same players as you because they have the funding and the backing to do it. And at some point, I just wonder, like, is Ohio State going to be able to keep up with that? History says yes, but it is a new era with the NIL stuff, and it does seem like Ryan Day's embracing it, so that's good. But I just don't know if they have, like, a, a donor, like one sole donor who's willing to bankroll the program the way that a Phil Knight is. I mean, I would say like Texas A&M came into the SEC with every single bit of money and finances that you could, and it really hasn't consistently translated. I would I would say the difference is I think the playing field's a little bit more even in the Big Ten. You know, in the SEC, a good deal of those programs are putting a good deal of their money into competing. They just are coming up against Alabama and LSU and Georgia and, you know, at times Florida or Tennessee. Um, I So I don't think the jump is as tough for Oregon, but like, I just look at it like a finally a worthy adversary. Like that's really what I look at with Oregon. And honestly, I wouldn't have said this three years ago. Um, the reason I'm saying it now is not only do they have unlimited resources with Phil Knight, resources have never been a problem. The problem has been, can you keep the coach that is going to be a difference maker? And from Chip Kelly to Dan Lanning, there were a lot of oopsies there. Like Mark Helfrich's tenure fell apart, the Willie Taggart stuff, even Mario Cristobal, who I he, think has he, been exposed a little yeah. bit going to Miami For with sure. less research. I, I felt like him at, at Oregon, though, he sort of got that program back in the direction where it was that's like, fair. okay, now and, – and that's why it was kind of surprising he left because it felt like he could really build something there. But I understand why he did because Miami is his alma, alma mater. But, yeah, I do. Th- I, I agree. Like, I think he's gotten exposed a little bit at Miami. But I think Dan Lanning is the no BS. Like, I think Dan Lanning yeah. is going to be a guy we look at over the next 20 years and say – that's the next Dabo. That's the next Saban. Like, I think they finally have a coach. Uh, honestly, maybe even more so than Chip Kelly. Like, the, you know, Dan Landing, we might look at as the coach of Oregon in, into the future because, like, he, one, he showed a commitment to stay there. So he's had opportunities to jet. I think if he wanted the Alabama job, he could have taken it. There have been other jobs that maybe aren't Alabama that are close. Um, I think Dan Landing is a no BS, terrifying coach. And and let me put it this way. I think if you put Dan Landing and Ryan Day, because I don't think there are very many coaches I'll say anymore because Saban's retired, uh, Urban's out of the game, um, Dabo's clearly fallen off a hill. Like, there's not very many coaches I'd actually say are better coaches than Ryan Day. I think Dan Landing is one of them. So I I really do. Like, he might be the guy I definitively say that. And I'm not used to saying that in conference. Like, I I said that with Jim Harbaugh. Yeah. Jim didn't have the resources that Michigan had. You know, like, you could make that case for Mark D'Antonio early, but Mark late in the career is college football changing. You know, Michigan State had peaked and then kind of whimpered out there at the end. So what's interesting is for 20 years, 
All I've heard from the rest of the Big Ten is, well, it's easy to be Ohio State when you have those resources and you can attract those coaches. Some have had the resources, but not the coach. Some have had the coach and not the resources. Oregon is 100% a threat, and like a serious threat, as soon as this year to Ohio State. I hope, and by the way, I hope that's the case. Because I think for a long time, the Big Ten has gotten by on their name. Penn State has not consistently been the threat they should be to Ohio State. Michigan only recently has been back as the threat. Um, Michigan State has fallen by the wayside. Even Wisconsin, there's a very definitive ceiling on what Wisconsin had previously built. So to have another true powerhouse, and I hope they don't stop there. I, I, I hope like uh, Florida State and Clemson, who are reportedly in talks with the Big 12, I hope you take them. You know, I hope you take another two so that when we look up, like I still think the SEC has more dominant football yeah. powers. Um, but I think with one more round of realignment and taking the right teams, I think you can snag that. And I think you can say definitively, you're the best you're, you're better at basketball, you're better at baseball, you're better at this, you're better at that. And I think it all starts with football, though. So I, I really – am I scared of Oregon? Yes. But I don't mind being afraid because that's kind of the whole thing. Like, it, being the big dog without any competition, we saw that in the Big Ten for a long time. And it really – like, it, it one, it spoiled Ohio State fans. Mm-hmm. Two, um, it, it, it honestly it didn't make it interesting. I mean, we this last year it was wake me up when you get to Michigan. That's not good for college well, football. Notre Dame that's made not, it close, but yeah. Well, but, <laughs> uh, that's fair. But like, there were like two teams that could yeah. conceivably challenge you, and I think that's kind of aided into Ohio State not having as much playoff success as you want because I do I believe in the theory iron sharpens iron, and I think it'll only make Ryan Day a better coach. I think it'll only make. Um, I think it'll only well, make, you know, even uh, recruiting. I think it'll make you better at that because you have to be sharper. Or it'll expose Ryan Day, and I think there's half the fan base that wants that anyway. You know what I mean? Like, this is going to test the the wits of the coach on a, on a number of different levels. But to your point on being afraid, like, am I worried about Oregon? Of course. And that's why I had that conversation several weeks back about are they the next biggest rival to Michigan uh, for Ohio State? And I think it's true because they're going to be the team that has the resources to compete with you with the NIL and the recruiting, they're going to have the teams that are, you know, running the same style of offense as you and trying to sort of win that way, but very finesse like and all these different things. Like, and, and and like, I understand where there's, there's some worry there and you don't want to lose any game. This is going to be the adjustment, right? Nick is because you have the 12 team playoff. It's okay to still be a little bit scared going into some of these games and be worried like, Oh, what if we lose to Oregon? But the idea is that hopefully that doesn't cost you your season. And then maybe you get Oregon again in the Big Ten championship game and you beat them, you win a conference title, then you're in the playoff. Or maybe you make the playoff anyway, even if you only lose to Oregon twice or something like that. And then you get a chance to go out and try to win a national championship. Like the idea is there's a little bit of give and take here. And I understand for some people that's tainted the sport because it's like, well, now these games don't mean as much. But the idea is it won't just completely derail your season just because you lose to a team that's on the same playing field as you and the same level as you. And it makes it more competitive. And the other argument for like the playoff expansion, conference realignment, all these different things that we, all these new things we're seeing in the sport is that again, Ohio state existed in a big 10 where they just kind of steamrolled their way through most years and they didn't have a lot of competition. Okay. Now you're going to actually test yourself against an, Oregon and against a USC in some years where maybe they're a better team and different stuff like that and put yourself in in the conversation for okay they are legitimately everyone always complains about the rankings right the first iteration of the college ball playoff rankings oh this team doesn't belong they haven't beaten anybody this and that this that and the third well now you're going to have a better picture of who the best teams in the country really are who the four teams are that deserve the bye weeks and all that as you get to the postseason it, it's 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 all like big picture wise what you want and so yeah I'm, I'm nervous about Oregon but I think that this is going to ultimately make the program better because they now know hey we can't rest on our laurels we got Oregon breathing down our neck all right guys follow us on social media at the eh, right there or I can't do it Spencer can you can you point to your social yeah, media right there we go sit you're better there. At this. 
There you go. <laughs> uh, and and we want to know from you guys. And, of course, uh, comment on the videos as well. Uh, can Ohio State compete with that just endless resources of Oregon? Are you worried at all that that could be a problem? And Spencer has himself questioning Ryan Day one more time. That's next right here on Sons of the Shoe. Welcome back, guys. Sons of the Shoe. Uh, as the beautiful slide graphic just showed, you subscribe to Sons of the Shoe wherever you get your podcast. Apple, Spotify, 923thefan.com. Have I mentioned Apple? Follow Sons of the Shoe. But Spencer, um, you and I were talking over the last day or two planning this, and I, it is fair to still have questions about Ryan Day, but I, I thought you had an interesting question about Ryan Day in Michigan Yeah, that I do think leaves some people, if they answer it the one way, feeling fatalistic about this year with Michigan and the future with Michigan as long as Ryan Day is a head coach. Yeah, so I forget. I, there was something I saw. I don't remember if it was like a video clip or is it somebody talking about like the, the mentality around Michigan at Ohio State over the years. Um, but I kind of, it kind of got me thinking back to the urban Meyer days. And then prior to that, like the Jim Trestle days and, you know, all you ever heard was that obviously over the years, Ohio state, the, the, the rivalry existed. Right. But there was always this like respect between like the two programs and, um, just the fact that like it was this it was this deep rooted you know like Woody Hay the, going back to the Woody Hayes days even they they hated each other but there was a respect for the fact that they were two of the best programs in the country going at it year after year and that that game meant something more than just you know it was more it was more than football it was bigger than football right it was like a way of life in a way and I think back to like even the early days of Ryan Day taking over and you had the comments in 2020 about like or I guess 2019. Maybe it was 2020 because they didn't, they didn't end up playing that year where he had the comments about like, yeah, you know, we're going to hang a hundred on him or whatever it was. And it just seems like every step of the way, there's this hatred from Ryan Day towards Michigan, but maybe not like the respect. And Because like I said, I think you saw that part of it with Urban and you heard the players talk about it too. The players would do interviews and they'd be like, yeah, you know, we, we have up on the wall – the countdown to the Michigan game every or the game every single year and all this different stuff. And it's a reminder of like what that game means and how we got to respect the rivalry. We got to like nurture it. We can't just walk in there and think we're going to own them. And you know, it's, it's, it's a meaningful thing. And so I think previous coaches maybe got through to the players with that a lot more and made that clear. And I think with Ryan day, it's almost just been like rip off the band aid. We hate them. They hate us. And I'm, I'm sure like, yeah, it was probably fuel to the fire when you have Jim Harbaugh say that you were born on third base comments and stuff like that. And that almost made it worse, but it never felt like there was like a respect between Ryan day and Jim Harbaugh or Ryan day in Michigan. It always has just felt like this very high, strong hatred. And I don't know if that's maybe had an impact on why they've taken a step back in regards to beating that team in recent years. So there's a good there. Uh, there's something I do want to get to out of the Colonel, what you're saying there, but it kind of just, uh, my observation with Ryan is I've never really got a sense of how he actually feels like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how seriously he takes this or whether he takes yeah. it too seriously or whether he, re you know, like every time he's talked about it. I mean, I think one of the flaws of Ryan is he is a bit of a robot as a human being. And when he gets in front of cameras, you don't really see anything authentic or, or genuine. And for all the things you can say about Urban, Urban was very much who Urban was. There was some very real honesty to the fact that he is a massive egoist and that he is he was is he kicking people in public like he did in, uh, with the Jaguars. Never kick a kicker. Everybody <laughs> knows that. That's a basic tenant, uh, at least in the NFL. But you can kick a kicker in college. But like, I've just never gotten the sense. Like, there are times where I'm like, oh man, he really must hate them. And then there are other times where I'm like, does he really get this rivalry? And I think that's a problem. Like, I think yeah. I never, I never guessed or second guessed where Jim Tressel stood on the rivalry. I never, 
ever second guessed where Urban Meyer was on the rivalry or Luke Fickle, who had his one year as, as head coach. The reason why Ryan Day gets so many comparisons to John Cooper is not just that John and Ryan both have had their struggles against Michigan, and they're really the two most foremost struggles Ohio State's had in 40 years yeah. against Michigan. Because the reality is, John, it took forever to beat Michigan and never did it consistently. Ryan actually beat Michigan up front, and it's just struggled recently. But I think what people... What, what what Ryan Day reminds people of John Cooper in is that you never really knew how much John cared about that game. He never seemed to put a special emphasis on it, and he never talked about how he put a special emphasis on it. And I think that's why when when Jim Tressel takes over Ohio State and says, um, I'm, I'm waiting for a game 360-some days from now, that was clear. Hey, this game matters more than any other game. Yeah. And we are going to put boots to asses. And then Urban Meyer openly talking about, hey, every day we do something to beat Michigan. Every day yeah. we focus on something. And I just don't think Ryan's done a good enough job of, one, beating Michigan, but, two, espousing how he's teaching these kids about these rivalries because it is a slippery slope. If you're not reinforcing every day, this is the greatest rivalry in the history of football. Beating them means more than anything else. It can start to feel like you're just, these guys are just on a pit stop in Columbus until the yeah. pros. And that is how you be, go from owning the Big Ten to being a team that's really good, but you're spending a lot of money to not be the best. But that's why I asked the question, too, because you bring up, you know, Urban mentioning every step of the way. Well, you know, we do something every day to, to prepare for Michigan or this is how we're getting ourselves in the right mindset for that game. That's, you know, 100 days away now, whatever it might be like. You don't hear Ryan Day say those things. And, and I think the problem for him is like all the stories about him getting fired up about Michigan. It's almost like they come from behind closed doors. Right. Like. There was the we're going to hang a hundred on him comments. There's always like these. He, I think he made some comments after last year about how, like, how much he was up studying the tape and mapping out a game plan for last year's game and, and all this different stuff. Like, he, he so desperately wanted to beat them because he's, he hasn't been able to do it the last couple of years that he was like putting every ounce of his energy into it because he hates them so much. But there's not like this, this path or these breadcrumbs along the way that leads you up to understanding what that game means and why it matters so much and that it is more than just football. But, yes, you obviously hate them and want to beat them. So I, I just think, like, it's it's how we've heard about him talking about it. Because you're right, like, he doesn't say anything publicly, and I almost wonder if that's the biggest thing that's doing him a disservice is he doesn't give the indication that he gets it publicly. I even think him yelling about Lou Holtz, like, I think that was even rooted in his hatred for Michigan because – all he heard all offseason was, oh, you can't beat those guys. They're tougher than you, and blah, 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 blah. And then the second one person who's uh, this, you know, old-timey analyst at this point in his career, you know, can't even really get coherent thoughts at this point, just kind of says things because he's that old. He's at that age. Jeez. Like, <laughs> All right. All right, take a little, take a little off the fastball there, Ryan. I don't. Day. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't do I mean, the man basically has like... dementia. He's decrepit. I mean, he we don't know. I, mean, I don't even know the man has reckless, a pulse. Reckless speculation, but he might. I have no idea. Uh, I don't know. I don't see his health records. You know, hip and all that protects that. But anyway, um, he's no, like, being kept alive. Can you tell by, by some sort of artificial means? He's not even alive. Can you it's tell like I don't weekend like at um, no, but like the second that's like, okay, but even if it wasn't Lou Holtz, like it could have been anybody. It could have been you and me on this podcast saying, yeah, I just don't think Ohio State's tough enough. And if Ryan, if it somehow made it to Ryan Day's desk, he would have been fired up and made some comment about it because he, he was so sensitive about that because all he'd heard was that they weren't tough enough to be Michigan. So I just think like, and I do think the Harbaugh and him aspect of this can't be understated. Like there was a clear disdain by Harbaugh for Ryan Day. And I think, like, you didn't see those two really interact a lot. And I'm not saying, like, Urban Meyer necessarily did either, but I still think there was at least, like, a respect there between those two. And you didn't, like, you eh, you never would have heard Jim Harbaugh say something like you were born on third base when it came to Urban Meyer. Like, he understood that that was a good coach who was whooping his ass all those years. And so even if he had beaten him once, it would have been like, yeah, you know, it's a good team over there. Like, I just don't think that would have been his MO, even though he tends to do that anyway. But I just... I don't know. I, I, I just think Ryan Day's like 
the entire concept of Michigan's existence and beating them. It's 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 kind of you know what it is. It is the storyline in Star Wars, right? How like hatred leads you to the dark side type thing. That's what it feels like. He is he he hates them so much that he can't see clearly into like how to beat them and how to go about things the right way and how to really instill in his team what the rivalry is supposed to mean. And if he would have just if he, if if that if the rival if his existence as the Ohio State head coach would have started with an understanding of like okay we got to respect those guys first and foremost then maybe things would have gone different for him the last couple of years. I just think it's as simple as, and I've thought about this a lot because I should be just ridiculously confident that Ohio State's going to run rough shot, even with Oregon. And we, you know, talked yeah. in the previous segment about Oregon. I, I really respect the hell out of Dan Lanning what he's doing there. Um, I, I, I fear Oregon as much as I've kind of feared Michigan over the last couple of years. But like Michigan should take a step back. New quarterback, you know they they gra- they put like thirty dudes out into the world as professional men. So that was you know that team got a lot younger over the off season. Ohio State reloading pretty much every. Se- I think they got a better quarterback, even if all Will Howard is is a more athletic quarterback than Kyle McCord. Um, but the thing in the back of my head is you went all in with building this roster. But that's not really the lesson that Ryan Day needs to learn. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, the roster's had some flaws. The offensive line is just not connected under Justin Fry. This is kind of a make or break for him as much as it is for Ryan Day, too. Yeah. But, like, where's Ryan Day talking about the lesson he learned about losing to Michigan? And that's the missing piece. Like, if Ryan Day thought the only reason he's lost the last couple well, of years I will for say, his roster, I think that's problematic. I will say maybe the lesson he learned is I got to get something off my plate, and that's why he brought in Chip Kelly. Like, that could be the lesson. But, but that doesn't have anything to do with beating Michigan. True, true. Because that was like, just, I think, a week-to-week thing. But, yeah. yeah I, I, like, I, like, well, but, again, that's another great well, sign-up. Could, he's clearly it, listened to everybody who said yeah. somebody else needs to run the offense. Right. He but, clearly well, he clearly listened to everybody who said somebody you need to go ahead and fix this roster because you don't have enough talent to beat Michigan, or let alone in Alabama or a Georgia. So he's listened to everybody on every critique. He is Ryan Day proofed in a way. If you think about it, he's tried to proof this team from every criticism they've had about his era at Ohio State for the last four years, five years. Yeah, except. I still don't know he takes he, I, I still don't know what his mentality is when it comes to beating Michigan. And I that is yeah. the that's the kernel of doubt that I have. I don't doubt I agree. I don't doubt Will Howard. I don't doubt Chip Kelly. I don't I, I think they're set up for the future at quarterback. I think this whole thing is set up to run for the next five years. And it's Ohio State and Oregon, and then probably Michigan and maybe one or two other schools that can pop up. But Ohio State is more than primed right now to transfer this to a national championship and above. But oh, if yeah. he hasn't learned his Michigan on, or he hasn't learned his Michigan lesson, it's all for naught. We're gonna be having the same conversation, well, and that's the thing that like, leaves me scratching my head. Why did you saw the value in answering those questions to everybody else? Why haven't you seen the value on answering the question on Michigan? And that's where I'm I'm a little bit nervous too. Like that's the one. I, you know, I think about that matchup coming up in November, and I'm like, oh, man, they should win this year. This is the year they win, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like that one little bit of, like you said, it's a kernel of doubt that creeps in where you're like, what if – like I just worry that if he doesn't – if he doesn't – if he goes into that game yet again with just this disdain in his heart of like, I hate that team so much, we got to beat them this year. And it doesn't – and it starts at that place rather than a place of – Listen, I respect them. I respect this rivalry. I get it now. We gotta, we gotta go with the right game plan and do this thing the right way. Then I just worry that it's gonna backfire on him again, and he's gonna try to like go for the jugular, and it's gonna blow up in his face. So I, I just, I, and I don't know if he doesn't say things publicly because he's too afraid to say things publicly, and it might come back and bite him in the ass. I don't know. Or but is he a I robot? Agree, I, but I agree with you that there's, you know, that's the one thing that makes that that gives me some pause because I worry that he just doesn't get it from a standpoint of like how you have to respect it while hating them. And he just straight up hates them and he tries to go in and it never just, it just doesn't work out for him when he, when he has that mentality about it, it's got to start from a place of respect. But even that 
and maybe it's because of the lack of respect that you're talking about, um, even his hatred of Michigan doesn't feel authentic. It, it like that's like the catch twenty two of I'd like to see you care more about this, but I don't want well, any more of the robotic. He, like, his hatred of Michigan comes from the fact Jim that he's lost. No, well, no, well he, Jim he hated Jim Harbaugh. He True. Didn't, I don't know that he hates Michigan. He hated Jim Harbaugh yes. being right about a lot of he things. He hated Jim Harbaugh, and I think the fact that now now it's at a place where it's like he's lost the last three years. So I think it just comes from a place where he's like, well, I can't beat them, so I hate them, and it's not a place of like this rivalry means something to this university, to this team, to this program. Like it, 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 it's, it, I think he's lost sight of that. And again, that's why I worry. Cause if he just comes about, uh, comes out, comes at it from a standpoint of hating them. And he's going to have the same relationship with Sharon Moore as he did with Jim Harbaugh. And it's just going to be this really tense thing. I don't know if that's going to work out for him again. All right, guys, we've got a lot on this. We do want to know his Ryan day learned his Michigan lesson after the last couple of years of getting uh, spanked by them, uh, let us know at Nick Wilson says at Spencito underscore on social media, including X. I also want to hear from you in the comments there. When we come back, it's time for four down territory, uh, just replete with Ohio State quarterback talk right here on Sons of the Shoe. One segment to go on Sons of the Shoe, guys, and it is time for Four Down Territory. And just kudos to Spencer for actually naming this what it should be named. Yeah, we've- I, re- I renamed it on a whim. I was like, eh, this does- I, well, I, I'll, I'll explain real quick. I couldn't remember if we called it fourth and short, fourth and long. I was like, hey, we got to do something to spice up this third segment. We're getting close to the season. I was like, I'm going to bring this back, but I'm going to rename it. And I'm just going to do four down territory. It makes sense. You got four topics. We're trying to tackle it in a short amount of time. It's, it's, I like it. I think it's a better name. So, no, I absolutely agree because I also, as the guy who came up with the bit originally, I also couldn't remember if it was fourth and short or fourth and long. And we called it both. <laughs> this things. is what happens when you're not here, Nick. I just, I just, you know, steamroll it's your a ideas power grab. And I this take is... it and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to name it what I want to name it. So, all right, you better be able to beat <laughs> Michigan, though. Okay, Ryan Day. Um, so let's start with number one, which was uh, like yourself, I've been watching a lot of the uh, hard knocks off season edition, which is actually potable. It's actually watchable now. I think and... it's the best, for, by the way, I think it's the best version of hard knocks we've ever gotten. Yes, like, which it's giving which you means, the content we've wanted. Like it's like all the behind the scenes stuff. It's awesome. Yep. Which means that the NFL is going to kill it. Oh yeah, very soon. It'll like, never happen again. I love that teams have the ability to okay what's out there, and then teams are like, "There's too much out there." It's like, well, dumbass, you can't <laughs> shape the narrative in the show and then get mad about it. But in the draft prospect interview, the Giants who it wasn't likely that Marvin Harrison Jr. was going to fall to six where the Giants picked, and they did end up uh, taking the wide receiver out of LSU. But, neighbors, yeah. but it was interesting to, to see the interview with Marvin Harrison Jr., who was kind of a trade-up candidate. Him and Drake May were the two guys the Giants apparently were thinking about trading up for. The wide receiver coach, Mike Groh, gave Marvin Harrison Jr., Every single opportunity to throw Marvin Harrison, uh, to throw Kyle McCord under the bus. And kudos to Marvin Harrison Jr. Because every time Mike Rowe was like, man, wouldn't it have been nice to get the ball like right on, right on spot. Hey, w- would it be nice if, uh, if like your quarterback didn't overthrow you by five yards, wouldn't that have been nice if that throw wasn't right at your feet? And every single time Marvin Harrison Jr. is like, no, I could have made that play. That's I mean, at one point he flat out asked him, I mean, that was a pretty shit throw, right? Like, yeah. I was like, man, we're just coming out throwing the haymakers on Kyle McCoy. I, I honestly laughed at that moment in the show. It was hilarious that Kyle McCord just caught random strays in hard knocks when he has, he, he's just minding his business in Syracuse getting ready for the season. And here he is catching strays on uh national TV. So I thought that was hilarious. Uh, like you said, kudos to Marvin Harrison jr. I don't know if they knew they had to know, like with the deep dives they do on these players, they had to know Marvin Harrison jr. And Kyle McCord played together in high school. Like they had such a history. They were friends. There's no way he was going to do that. And obviously Marvin is, is just a good all around dude. I, I think that was truly just what it was. Um, because they even talked about on the show, like, yeah, for who his dad is and all that, like he has no ego. It's pretty crazy. So I think they just went in with the idea of like, let's just see if he has like anything negative. We're probably not going to draft him anyway. Let's just see 
if he has any reaction that would make turn us off to maybe wanting him. Um, but yeah, he he didn't he didn't uh, he didn't budge, so that was good. But I, I thought it was hilarious. And to be fair, like be he wasn't wrong. There was a lot of shit throws last year from Kyle McCord. I also think I'm incredibly vindicated when an NFL wide receiver coach goes, "Man, didn't your wide receiver or didn't your quarterback suck?" Um, yeah. and would not let it go. Because uh, Keith Britton and I, you heard it. Keith Britton and I had a knockdown drag out fight yeah, about yeah. Kyle McCord because his point, and there is some validity to what he's saying. His point is that Kyle McCord it wasn't the only thing wrong with last year's Ohio State team. My rebuttal was with a quarterback that doesn't throw two picks. And really, I should have specified on the first pick. The first pick in the mission game was Awful. one of the most egregious picks in, <laughs> so in the history of the rivalry because it it basically gave all the momentum to Michigan. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at it, Ohio State was consistently playing for me, hunt from, from that early touchdown on, Ohio State actually kept pace step for step with Michigan. Without that first interception, you win, literally. You win yeah. that game. And so we got into a huge Donnybrook about it. But I do think, like... Did you watch the tape yet? I, I've watched the tape. And anybody who <laughs> watched this podcast knows I watch the tape. Um <laughs> Then I took a massive shot. It was it, here's how good of a shot he took at me, and then how good of a shot I responded in fire at the end was that both times Ohio State alum and my beautiful co-host Dustin Fox made the face. <laughs> Anytime people firing shots at each other on air can get a shocked face out of Dustin, that means you woke him up, you made him pay attention. And now he actually understands the references being thrown. It was around. the uh, it was the the, the uh, Django Unchained scene with Leo where he's like, "You have my curiosity, but now you have my attention." That was yep. Dustin. Basically, that's exactly yep. what it is. So uh, Kyle McCord still shit. Now moving <laughs> to uh, the second of our four down territory topics: Shador Sanders of Colorado. And it's not been a good optics offseason from Colorado. Dion has stepped in it a few times. Shador, has, every member of the Sanders family apparently stepped in it. Well, Shador Sanders uh, had a very quotable comment on how people are treating Colorado football uh, uh, since the Sanders have arrived. In terms of him operating with a certain obligation, does that – sort of flow over to you as his son and being in the spotlight as you just answered that it's a different level in how you feel you have to perform do you have an obligation to perform at a different level it been that since day one i remember first uh media day when i was in hbcu i said well, we won't lose a game i'm undefeated in the swag so I, I i already know what the expectation comes with I know where everybody's Super Bowl, so I'm really just uh, – I always stay level-headed, stay grounded because um, I just – I would never want to be that guy, look back, and not being able to take advantage of the moment that we have right now. So there's a lot in there. I'm just going to start Can I say with... real quick? I just want to say I think it's funny that he has, like, the same cadence in speaking as his dad. Like, it was very uh, John David Washington – where like I, I first saw him in like Ballers, the HBO uh, second HBO reference to the show, and it was like, oh, that he sounds like Denzel Washington. And then I looked it up, and I was like, oh, that's his son. That makes a lot of sense. It's kind of funny. I also think him dropping being undefeated in the SWAC is maybe yeah. the softest like flex you. That's could like me saying make. I'm the best radio host out of uh, Steubenville, Pennsylvania. Like, okay, listen, um, from people that went to Woodridge High School, who host a radio show in afternoon drive, I am the most successful. Now, see, that that's actually a trick because Jeff Phelps actually uh, was also a Woodridge guy and has hosted, ah, but just not an afternoon okay. drive. All Suck right. it, Phelps. Um, <laughs> but my um, the other part of this is I do love when he's like, you know, I'm just trying to stay level-headed uh, level and grounded. Like, if you call yourself, if you say, we know we're everybody's Super Bowl, you can't then say we're grounded. And it's funny, like this is, it, it's like it's like assessing hype that you yourself created. Um, I don't think everybody gave that much of a crap about no. playing Colorado. I do think they wanted to shut them up when it comes to USC and every team that they lost to the final eight games of the season. I do think people wanted to shut them up, but it's not the same as 
you're getting everybody's best game because they know they have to play their best game to beat you. Yeah. Other, other teams, quite frankly, didn't play great football and still beat your ass. Yeah, I kind of thought about it from the Ohio State lens when I heard that quote because I was like, if if Ohio State had Colorado on their schedule, would they really be looking at their schedule right now like, you know what, that trip to Colorado in late October, that's the game. That's the Super Bowl when you got Oregon on there, you got Michigan on there, you got you know Big Ten title hopes at some point here, you got championship hopes. But yeah, uh, a trip to Colorado – is the Super Bowl. I mean, I guess on one hand, he's kind of right in that, like, whenever people seem to play Colorado or they came to Colorado, you had all the stars showing up, you know, rappers were in attendance, celebrities were in attendance. So that was kind of cool. It kind of gives it that Super Bowl feel because all the Super Bowl is nowadays is, you know, the the blue co- or the white collar, you know, I got a lot of money people showing up, the, the business folks showing up to, to games. But at the same time, like, there's plenty of teams around this country who aren't looking at you like, oh, yeah, that's that's our Super Bowl um and like they were cool for a moment in time when they started the season 4-0 and I was actually hoping like they'd make a bowl and and finish strong and I kind of you know I'm rooting for Deion Sanders to have success because I think his story is great but then you hear stuff like this and it makes you not necessarily feel like you need to to be in their corner because they're they got enough of themselves in their corner so they're they're, yeah it's, it's it's so tough man because I do think that Deion winning the way that he's winning and I'm not I'm not talking about just completely not recruiting high school players i still think that's stupid <laughs> uh, and, and saying well, it's insane, gonna be like, I'm, I'm curious like he said that right now he can do that because like he has travis hunter who's playing both ways he has a son who's one of the yeah. top quarterback prospects in the country going into next year what's gonna happen when you lose those guys you know what i mean yeah. like what does your team look like you have some really good players really great players but is once you lose those guys and you have the built-in thing of like well my son's coming here because it's my son what are you going to have if you're not even trying to recruit through high school? I mean, it's the two ends of the portal, right? It's it's Clemson saying, I'm not going to do that at all. And and it's Colorado saying, that's the only way we're going to build a team. Um, I do think going to the Big 12 is actually a good thing for them because, you know, like they got skunked last year in a really tough Pac-12. Yeah. In a normal Pac-12, that's probably a 6-6 six and six team last year, even with their deficiencies. So that's probably a bowl team last year. This year, you I think you're going to have an easier schedule because it's the Big 12 and it's not, you know, Texas and OU are gone. So I think that helps. I I do want Dion to succeed because I think Dion can tap into something. He's great that in is the a, game. Well, I, I think guys like Dion, former pros, I, I think they just bring a different element. And I think college football is at its best – when there are different kinds of programs, you know, when the CEOs have their spokesperson and you can point to the guy that's the the play caller, brilliant mindset. And then you've got the guy that is the former player that has a different way of attacking it. Because at the end of the day, what that does is it gives kids who are 18 a chance to find somebody whose voice fits them. And I think that's totally like, I don't know how you feel. Like, I'll be honest with you. I could have been a very, very good football player. I could have been a very successful athlete. I never had coaches. I didn't have the built-in understanding and belief in myself to do it myself. So for me to have ever been, whether it's a great high school wrestler, a great high school football player, I needed to find coaches that fit who I was. And I found one, and three months later, he was fired. And that, and so I, I don't want to make it all about me uh, because Coach uh, Killer Nick over here. I, mean, I am a Coach Killer. Everybody knows that. That and you, you and know, LeBron financial cuts. But um, <laughs> but I do like the more voices and the more archetypes that are out there. I think it's good for kids. Agree. At the same point, Dion Shador, the entire Sanders clan, they're really good when the public's on their side at manipulating things. And, and and when I say that, I don't mean it in a bad way. I mean like manipulating the hype to gain favor for themselves because that's what you need to do with boosters. The problem is they also don't know how to read the room when the, when the landscape is shifted on them. There are more people now rooting against Colorado because of Dion's comments this offseason. And because of the comments in general, there are more people rooting against Colorado all of a sudden than there are rooting for Colorado. And why that matters is... The public, meaning the media and fans, we're just a representation of the boosters. And at Colorado specifically, 
the boosters will make or break Dion. Mm-hmm. And while they breath of fresh air, new style, he's cocky, he's confident. We got sellouts going on. Um, now you got to repeat it. Yeah. Now you got to live up well, to the hype. And they said and, he already and that at some point the boosters will lose their faith in you, and they'll lose it quicker if you talk out your ass half the time and don't realize that people think you're a little bit fraudulent, which is where people are with Dion and that thing right now. Well, and real quick, final thought I'll say, if uh, if it's true that because of the economy he brought with him that he already basically paid for himself, that makes it a little bit easier for a pill to swallow if they have to like buy out his contract or something like that too. You know what I mean? Because that was the whole thing was, oh, how are they going to even pay him? Well, uh, they had this injection of money with him just coming to campus last year and the, the hot start they got off to. So if that's the case, then uh, they probably feel somewhat vindicated. Like, okay, we've already basically paid Dion off, paid Dion uh, his 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 pay, and now uh, if 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 it doesn't go the direction that he's hoping it goes, then they have an easier way to sort of validate. Like, okay, it worked for a period of time, and now we can move on. All right, now we move on to uh, our third topic here on Four Down Territory, and that is we are hurtling towards the release of college football 2025. I pre-ordered it. Oh, I got to get a PS5. That's the problem is I don't have PS5. Facebook Facebook Marketplace. Um, I mean, I can just go on Amazon. That's true. We talked about me replacing my camera because I look like a pixelated version of myself (laughs) here and what a cheap ass I am. That's a good poll. That's a good poll right there. Should Nick fix his camera on his computer first or get a PS5? Or I'm going to throw this out there. Phil Knight, if you're watching, I said some nice (laughs) things about you earlier. If you could buy me a PS5 and college football uh, 2025 and a new rig so we could do the podcast. He'll pick and, Mich- he'll pick, oh, I must say Michigan. He'll pick Oregon on the podcast when they honestly, play State. any of the billionaires out there, millionaires out there, if you would like to be <laughs> my work sugar daddy, right? If, if you just supply me with things that make my work job and my work life easier without the advantage of sex, I'm here for you. Um, that being said, <laughs> when, when you, when you download college football, 2025, are you starting a dynasty with Ohio State right out the rip, or will you start in the trenches with another school? So I'm gonna I'm gonna be sort of an on the fence answer because I'm gonna do both. Here's the reason, though, Nick, and you can certainly understand this because you know back in the day when I had college football 14 or whatever the hell it was, I didn't have to worry about kids running around my house, right? Like I I, I wasn't a family man. I was just a, I was just living at home doing whatever. So now. I, I I don't have the time as much to dedicate to like the full like, well, let's start at the bottom and work our way up. So I'm going to start a campaign like that. Shout out probably University of Akron where I worked. I'll probably start there. And then I'll work my way through the trenches to Ohio State. But that I know is going to take me a long, long time to get through. So I will also just start one with Ohio State that I can play when I get that hour every week of free time away from my child and making sure that I'm, I'm nurturing the relationship I have with my wife. I'll have some. T- <laughs> You're throwing all <laughs> this shit bad. away right now. That's these these are eraser phrases. <laughs> you don't mean any of this. They are on an island. Oh, all right. Man. One week from now, the rest of the German family will not even exist according <laughs> to you. Like, don't, don't, oh, don't okay, I guess I'm just my relationship the with my wife. I guess I'm starting at the bottom, man, and just working my way up. Then. Brittany, get a good book collection because you're not going <laughs> to see this man for months. All right? You better be prepared to take care of that kid by yourself because <laughs> when he's recording a podcast the next couple months – it's going to be because he's on hey, college football. Yeah, 2020. Nick and I, we're doing a special two-hour episode this week. so Yeah, but I'm going to be up in the office. But don't come bug me because, you know, we'll have to start over again if you do. <laughs> um, I'm going to start Bowling Green. And can I tell you, I'm so excited to start. I, I really fell in love. I, I've always had a love for the Mac because I grew up around here. But when I was in the South, I loved me some Sun Belt, man. I love App State. Um, you know, looking at other programs, I love, one. I love Charlotte, uh, the Charlotte 49ers. My boy Will Healy had him running for a minute. Didn't quite work out, but uh, I am I really, truly, truly, deeply cannot wait to, one, bring the Ivy League superpower that is Bowling Green State. There's Ivy on the walls, damn it. You will look at that Ivy the next time you're in Bowling Green. And to bring them back to prominence, and get them into the Big Ten within five years, 
And then I will be taking the Charlotte 49ers, ramming it all up everybody's ass, and they'll be in the SEC. I'll, I'm going to go a little bit more conservative inside 10 years. And then after I bring those two. Oh, you're going to join. You're gonna, wait, wait. You're going to make, you're going to put Bowling Green in the SEC. No, no. Like oh, because you can't Green do that. Big Ten. You can, oh, okay. Okay. And Charlotte in the SEC. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Totally different. That'd be ridiculous putting Bowling Green in the SEC. I mean, hey, not more, not any more ridiculous than in the uh, trailer that came out recently that had Clemson in the Mac all of a sudden. So how about that? Somebody was like, hey, they deserve a demotion. Maybe uh, Dabo Sweeney said, thinks that uh, in the Mac, it's, you know, God is on your side. So that's why he was like, I'll go there and win instead of worrying about NIL. I probably am going to make a Mac Sunbelt Super Conference, but I digress. Um, <laughs> but no, and after I get those two programs where I want them to, maybe a dalliance with App State in North Carolina, then I will take my rightful place as chief ass kicker of Ohio State football. I like it. So uh, final one here as we are in the fourth down of fourth down territory. Uh, it is Joe Burrow, former Ohio State quarterback uh, to some, uh, he was on the Pardon My Take podcast and got into that. What would you say to Ohio State fans that try to claim you? I didn't play football there. I mean, I practiced football there. But did a lot of practicing. I did a lot of practicing <laughs> and lifting. You graduated? I graduated. I usually tell people that I went to school at Ohio State and I played football at LSU. That's good. Yeah, like, I like that. I like got a, a lot better from practicing at Ohio State, but I didn't get to play, so I don't really say that I right. played uh -huh. there. I think that's a that fair answer. Sense. I got to live the backup quarterback lifestyle back then, and that was fun. Um, got that out of my system, and then I was able to lock in. Yeah. yeah. Starting's a lot more fun. I would a imagine. lot more fun. I would love to be a backup, though. I would love it to seems be a backup. Like a I mean, job. it was pretty fun for a couple yeah. years. I'd yeah. like to be a third string. It, yeah, I really wasn't exactly. No you don't have to be yeah. that prepared. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Because well, you're really like, if if you get to the third string, everyone's like, "Well, we're gonna suck anyway." Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't say I was super happy. Yeah, but I did have fun. Yeah, I would say. So there's a few things there. Actually, low key, a smack at LSU. I went to school at Ohio State, but I played football at LSU. <laughs> Yeah, uh, basically, uh, your education was not worth my time. Not saying a lot about the LSU education that he got there. Um, I don't really have a problem with this. I know this riles up people every time he talks about it. Uh, do, do you get hot and bothered about this? No. Um, I, th I mean, I think it's just fun to sort of have the conversation of like, so can based off of those comments, are we still claiming him? I, I think it's fine to still claim him. I, th I think his answer really is perfect. Like him being like, hey, I went to school at Ohio State. And I was a backup quarterback there, and I, I my degree is from Ohio State, and he 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 did go back and finish that I know and got the degree, so that's good. Um, I think it's fine that people want to say, hey, you know, Ohio State product, you know, maybe he's not some Ohio. We we can't put him in like in the legend category. We can't say he's up there with you know the greats at Ohio State, the Heisman winners, and all these different things. But we can say that he was a product of Ohio State on top of being the. Uh, championship quarterback that he was at LSU. I, I think it's fine to sort of lump them together, but I think his points sound, and I too would probably enjoy the experience of college more as a backup quarterback rather than the starting quarterback. But he, I mean, no, in, in a lot of ways, no, hold on, real quick, real wait, quick. in a lot of the ways, starter, the starter at Ohio State or LSU gets boy band ass. That is true. Okay, but hold on, at, like you I, still get. I, I guarantee you though, because listen, I've heard stories of people who like work for a baseball team. And they go in and say, like, yeah, I'm a minor league player in this system. And they can land whatever person they want to land at some bar. So you can make up whatever like whatever story you want about being a professional athlete or an athlete in general. And it's sometimes a work for you anyway. So if you're the backup quarterback at Ohio State, that's still going to be something that pulls in a decent amount of ass for you. And you get to just enjoy the experience more. I think Burrow actually had, like, the best story arc of college you could possibly dream of. It's, it's kind of like that whole thing where it's like you have fun and then you settle down your senior year with somebody that you're going to hopefully marry. That's basically what I did in college. I was single for three years and then I found my I, – no, I didn't find her. We were friends, but we started dating senior year and now here we are married. So I think it's the same sort of thing. He had a chance to like just enjoy college for like three years. And then he, that, that fourth and fifth year he was like, all right, you know what? Now it's time to take this a little more seriously. I'm going to go play football and actually go win a national championship somewhere. I think that's the best way you can play that. Yeah, I don't, but Joe kind of admitted there 
he preferred just to have started the beginning. That actually is like, if you look at it, you can't tell me that there weren't moments where they're like, Joe Burrow's a better quarterback than Dwayne Haskins, but we kind of built the pipeline on Dwayne. It's close enough. We're going to yeah. give the job to Dwayne. Well, I also think, let's face it, Joe Burrow wasn't Urban Meyer style of quarterback for his offense. Like that wasn't going to work in, in what he did. He was I mean, very Dwayne much. Dwayne was, Dwayne was very much a drop back quarterback. Right, like yeah, I mean, Dwayne and Joe. I mean, Joe's Joe. Well, actually, I would say Joe had a Dwayne, little bit more boogie to him. Wasn't Dwayne also the like the first year when yeah. he started? Wasn't that the first year Ryan Day was in as offensive coordinator too? Oh, now timing wise, you're probably right. And so yeah, that's you where went, they you went Haskins I, to Fields, yeah. Right. So I think they sort of shifted a little bit, like the philosophy then, and so. Dwayne had kind of been the next in line, so they went to him. But yeah, I, I Burrow just never stood a chance after that because they kept bringing in like great recruits. But yeah, I don't know. I I think I'm sure he probably did want to start immediately. But I think looking back, he gets the the best college experience of any quarterback that you could have. You wanted you ended up winning national championship anyway, so you get the ring, you get the ladies, and you got to enjoy college in this in the same. In, I'm, in, I'm in, just gonna tell place. you. I'm just gonna tell you. Being a starter is way better than being a backup. Local dealerships don't give cars to the backup quarterback unless hey, he is unless he true. is like the heir apparent. Quinn, you, Quinn Ewers Quinn Ewers got some NIL money and then took it and ran. So yeah, thank you for pointing out the anomaly. The <laughs> one time that that actually happened. Uh, all right guys that does it for us. Follow Sons of the Shoe wherever you get your podcast. Apple, Spotify, 923 the fan, uh of course the free Odyssey app as well. Make sure to follow the nine uh the Sons of the Shoe podcast also, follow us on social media at Nick Wilson says at Spencito underscore. We'll be back next week. I'm I'll be back. I don't know if Spencer will be back. I'll He's be got back. the game coming out. God knows. I mean, <laughs> you know, Lil, Lil, Lil Spence and uh and, and his lovely wife aren't the only people gonna be neglected by college football 2025 coming out. <laughs> but uh thanks for following along, guys. Follow uh, subscribe to 92 through the fans YouTube channel. Like the videos, comments the videos, want to hear what you have to say. Spence, good stuff, buddy. Be good. Go Bucks.